So good morning and welcome everyone to today's Wellness Wise webinar, Financial Wellness and Employer Obligation. My name is Katrina Walton and I'm founder and director of Wellness Designs and we're a boutique workplace wellness consultancy business and we support Australian organisations to create healthy, safe and high performing workplaces. Uh, it's great to see such a range of attendees again along for today's session. Certainly some new faces together with a host of regular ones including a number of our wellness Wellness wise practitioners so a big shout out to them and we're very much looking forward to today's webinar topic um, certainly a dimension we feel has been traditionally very overlooked as far as employee wellness and that is around financial wellness now personal finance continues to be one of the leading causes of stress for employees and I know I'm sure many of us have had um, sleepless nights at some stage worrying about our finances and as someone uh, as a small business owner married to another small business owner I know we've certainly um, had our share of those in the household over the years uh, and ultimately financial wellness represents having a sense of control over our finances and also our financial future. So today's web webinar, we're going to delve into the impact of financial stress in, into the workplace and more importantly, look at how some Australian organisations are supporting the financial wellness of their employees. So before we um, kickstart and introduce our facilitator for today's session, I just wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping and look at how you can gain the most out of today's webinar. If you haven't already, just an opportunity to check the audio settings on your computer. And also, as you'll see, you have the opportunity to ask questions as we go along. And I know Paul, our facilitator, has indicated he, has, he is happy to answer some questions as we go and we'll also have an opportunity to seek further at the end of the webinar. You'll also see there's an opportunity there too to, to chat to the facilitators as we go. So if you have any queries, feel free to just drop us a line. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure now to introduce you now to our facilitator for today's webinar, Paul Feeney, who is the founder of Map My Plan. And Paul is passionate about changing the way that people access independent financial advice. And after 10 plus years as a private banker and also financial planner, is now approaching financial advice with fresh eyes, with the aim of making it available to everyone and really cutting that link between advice and product sales. In Paul's spare time, he loves traveling, having lived and worked in Kenya, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. So welcome, Paul, and I will now hand over to yourself. Thank you very much, Katrina, and thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, so Matt, my plan, we conducted some research um, in 2015 and also in 2016 on the financial fitness of working Australians. Um, sure that goes on to the next slide. We looked at what's the financial stress points that working Australians have and also the impact that that has on the workplace. All right, so yeah, we conducted a research paper just really on the financial fitness of working Australians, really looking at what are the financial pain points and what is the actual cause, what is the impact of financial stress in a workplace. We there's a link there later on you can go along and have a look at that research but today I'm really looking going through and empowering you all with the information that we had that helps you have a more of a conversation with your colleagues at your organization you're working and really giving you data that backs up the need that financial wellness is an important thing in any workplace and from our perspective it really is an obligation of an employer. Here's a little bit about Matt, my plan uh, in a quick summary we basically built a self-directed virtual financial planner that lets anyone build a financial plan. I'm not gonna go into a big sales pitch about me. We're here to talk about the research, but you can go through and explore it and contact me later if you, if you wanna know a bit more about us. So to get straight into it, what is financial fitness? Our perspective is that we look at financial fitness as an ability for people to have control over their financial situation and feel empowered. The quote down the bottom there is from a partner of Ernst & Young, but our research identified the four major pain points of financial stress in the workplace. We also then created a financial fitness index, which I'll delve into and in what we researched there, but the average Australian is 113 out of 200, which essentially means that if they lose their job today, in less than a month, they're going to go into debt to put food on the table. 
So how do we measure the financial fitness of working Australians? We look at three, or sorry, four key areas. The first two, control over personal finances and ability to absorb a financial shock, really looks at their ability, um, their financial ability and where they are in their finances. The next two, planning for the future and financial freedom, really look around the knowledge they have, the perception they have around the ability to manage their finances. Because a lot of financial wellness is, is the one, you've got the monetary means, but then also the ability for people to take control themselves over their financial affairs and feel as though they have the knowledge to make well-informed decisions through their financial life. What does this come through to? Well, we have four distinct levels of financial fitness. 29% of Australians we classify as, as financially unfit, we're unable to meet regular payments. You think of the level of average fitness, which is where most Australians fit, they are really living month to month, maybe a little bit better off than month to month, but too much more. And then we move up to financially fit, where you know, you're living a pretty good life, but there are still certain limitations. And then for less than 10% of the population, financially super fit, where they're able to do the things they want to do when they want to do them. And the bottom boxes there just give you some characteristics over the individuals who fall into those areas. Delving straight into the research, uh, the gender divide. Uh, we've broken that down into the different levels of financial fitness. But you can see distinctly that there's around about a 15% gap of financial level of financial fitness between men and women. Um, and it's, for us, it's, it was quite interesting to see that for ASX 200 companies, the gap is even wider, uh, which came to a bit of a shock for us. But you can see that only a third of women are fit or super fit, the two areas of level of financial fitness where we want to be, where it's almost half for men. And I mean, we don't need to go through all the reasons. Most of us know what uh, is behind those stats. And then comparing the generations, once again, through the different levels of fitness, but the ones that stick out there is, is Generation X. Um, financially, just not as fit as the others. Their main focus and concern is on housing. Their level of savings is a lot lower. And surprisingly, they are the lowest generation that actually uses a financial planner to help with their finances, less than 10% of that generation actually goes out and gets professional help, if I can use that term for the lack of a better one. So what's the impact? What impacts the financial stress levels? Um, you can go through and have a look at the entire research paper, but I brought out two that really statistically show a big gap. Um, renting versus home ownership. Renters are distinctly lower level of financial fitness, as we would probably make the assumption that a lot of their a lot of their income goes on housing, uh, which can bring about a lot more financial stress. But it's a huge gap between those two. Um, and then salary. Surprisingly for us, salary did not make a huge difference. Um, you've got a slight improvement when you're over 120,000, um, but it's only when you start earning more than 150,000 the financial fitness score goes up. Um, and then households, when they're over 200,000, that level of financial fitness goes up. But it's also worth noting that there's still a large percentage of that, of that population that struggle with their finances on a month-to-month -month basis. But finance and, and pay packet is not the panacea. It's not a matter of you going back and saying, let's make everyone financially healthy in our workforce. We have to give them more money. That may help for a couple of months, but in the longer term, it, it has very, very little impact on the level of financial uh, fitness that people have. Most people were underprepared, underinsured. Under um, Seven percent of people go immediately into debt um, if they lose their job. Very few of us have um, good savings levels. And for me, a surprising one was insurance is quite low. Only one in three Australians said they have life insurance. But we actually know through the default mechanisms of superannuation is that most people have life cover. This means that around about 8 million working Australians do not know that they've got life insurance. Uh, for me, that's a blight on the industry. Um, it needs to be fixed there as well. So the real cost of financial stress in a workplace. We went through and looked at, and we asked individuals, how much time in a working week do you spend dealing with or thinking about your personal financial affairs? The rationale being, if you're doing that, you're distracted. Your level of productivity in the workplace has decreased. With 50% of Australians saying they're worried about their finances, it's going to have a huge impact on every single organisation. We've got almost 40% of people spend at least two hours a week 
Um, but renters, for example, well, if you're one of the 34% of people who rent, you're spending more than four hours a week. That's half a day a week distracted by your finances. So you're not actually focusing on your work. We then look at, well, productivity loss due to financial anxiety. We know it exists. Um, and it's, it's really coming through and looking at, so well, if this many people are financially stressed, it's going to have a huge impact on our workplace. Um, we work with Ernst & Young, who have rolled my plan out for all of their staff as an employee financial wellbeing tool. And the quote underneath there, I think, really sums it up. The part in bold, it's like, it impacts productivity, it impacts on satisfaction at work, and it can even ultimately affect physical health as well. This is where I believe financial well-being is an obligation for employers. Not only, we, we all go to work for two main reasons. It's to be engaged and do something productive, but let's face it, we don't do it for free. It's to make sure our financial lot in life and that of our family is better off. So in those things there, we've got to make sure as an employer that we're empowering people to continue and, and make the most out of those two, ob two object ob objectives uh, when we go to work. And there's a great productivity uplift for any sort of firm that helps improve the financial well-being of their staff. You get that average time down and you're going to have more productive workforce. So what's the cost of financial stress um, in the workforce? In our research of just under 1,600 people across Australia, when we ask people how much time they spend uh, each week dealing with them and thinking about their personal finances while at work, we also asked about a salary ban that people are on, and someone was between 60 and 80,000. We assume for this math that they're on 60,000. But the average cost, just in terms of lost salary alone, is over 4,500 for every single employee across every organisation in this country. I'll just let that hang for a moment. That is a huge loss of productivity and a huge loss of salaries that we've got. You can see the differences there between uh, different types of employers and so forth as well. We did find that there's a little bit less financial stress uh, for those who work in the government. Um, and that's probably around that perception of security uh, where tenure tends to be a little bit longer in government roles and, and pay tends to be a little bit higher than the, you know, than the country average as well. So what can we do? Um, it's simply having a plan. In our research, we asked individuals, does your employer provide you with financial wellbeing tools? And only 14% of them said they do. And if we dig deeper into that stat, about two thirds of those answers are based on XYZ superannuation firm coming in and giving their biannual, uh, so the semi-annual uh, presentation. But we then asked individuals, would you be interested if your employer provided you financial wellbeing tools? And almost 60% of employees said that they would. We then looked at, so let's compare the financial fitness with those that do provide these tools and those that don't. There's a 20 point increase, so an 18% increase in the level of financial fitness of staff where employer actually takes a proactive approach and provides them with what they're doing uh, with their financial life. Um, there's even a higher interest from employees um, at, in government departments, with 62% wanting their help. We then look at it and say, well, the next step is, how do we actually improve someone's financial fitness and financial wellbeing? It's to enable them to have a plan. We looked at three different types of levels of a financial plan that an individual may have. No plan in the red, a rough plan, and a comprehensive plan. We said, well, each individual should be aiming for a financially fit or super fit uh, level of financial well-being. If you look at people with no plan at all, only 20% of those individuals are financially fit or super fit. And as soon as someone has a rough plan, this might just be a spreadsheet with a few objectives written down, the level of the number of people that are financially fit or super fit doubles to over 40%. It almost doubles again when someone's got a comprehensive plan. So the evidence is quite clear. It's not about increasing salary. It's about giving people the ability to have a plan. We all know that if we're in a stressful situation and someone lays down the tracks and you can see the, end, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the level of cortisone in your body just drops automatically. And so having the plan allows them to go about doing that. Um, and that's what we're about as an organisation, 
um, is trying to make sure that any Australian wants to build a plan can. Um, but it's, it's then having your organisation go through and take that seriously. So the last thing I want to talk about really is just around a case study around Ernst & Young uh, in Australia deployed Map My Plan as an employee wellbeing tool. They conducted a survey um, late last year of all of their staff and found that stress levels in the workplace, particularly financial stress, were a huge concern that came up continually across the workforce. You may be thinking about Ernst & Young, great accounting firm and so forth. They should be at a level of, of higher level of financial fitness. But it, it, it permeates across all, all organisations. So they took this seriously and went out to find a solution where their staff are then empowered to go out and build a plan for themselves. How we went about doing this is we worked with Ernst & Young, um, went through a lot of due diligence to look at the platform. The fact that we guarantee to never sell a financial product uh, sat extremely well with them, uh, but also the fact that we're fully licensed. We've got our own financial services license, uh, gave a certain level of comfort. We then created a, a campaign, I suppose, an internal campaign for them, where we build a, in, build a, a homepage for their staff to be able to go to. We look at emailing out to all of their staff um, a few different messages to bring them onto the site. They then go on and through a process of self-discovery, they start building a financial plan. It's not a process where they're asked to answer 150 questions. They just go through, they ask anywhere between six and 12 questions, they stop, they get a bit of information about what they should do and they continue on their journey. The next page here is just a, a few quotes from one of the senior partners of, of, um, of the organization and how well it's going. Um, by all means and purposes, they're, they're pretty happy with what's going on. Um, but I'm quite sure that if some of you are interested, you could probably have a chat with them as well. And we'll share these slides with you later. There's a, a link there um, for the slide after that as well. Um, I find these things a little bit better if you just open up to questions and let people uh, go down the path they want. But Katrina asked me just to put down a few links to sites that can really help and, and provide good financial literacy and stuff down. And that's what we've got there, my contact details as well. But I'll hand back over to, to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. So hopefully some yeah, useful follow-up resources there. And thank you to Paul for providing those. So we're now going to open it up to questions to Paul and maybe while we're waiting for those to come through Paul one question I'd noted here is in the research that you undertook did you observe any differences in financial fitness across companies of different size or nature of companies that you mentioned the government there was a slightly different level of financial fitness um, yeah we, we didn't notice a huge difference between sizes of organizations it was more around uh, the government department and the the private uh, that we saw the, the size of the organisations, the most, most employers uh, are smaller employers, uh, but most of the research and so forth I mean, was, it was across all of those, but the level of financial fitness didn't change across those. There was no difference between, in the private sector, the types of organisations that wanted help, but there was a, an uplift in the government department. Uh, they seemed to, to want a, a bit more help from their employer with those sort of tools. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. And the other question you touched on briefly as part of the results of the survey, just what is the impact of salary on financial fitness then? What were some of your obs observations in that research? Yeah, we, we found that until someone's salary is well above the national average, almost double, um, it doesn't really impact financial fitness at all. Uh, my experience through wealth management and financial planning is that individuals lifestyle expands as their salary expands. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a natural human thing to do. Uh, and it's not until really you get to $150,000 a year, which is around about 10% of the population, um, where salary has an impact. Um, but that's also, the correlation there as well is interesting because a lot more of those individuals have got a comprehensive plan as well. They've gone and engaged a financial plan or whatever it may be. So to, and equivocally say that salary is it, or is it really the fact of getting a plan? There's, there's, there's multiple factors in play there, I suppose. Fantastic, thanks Paul. We've had a question come through from Bron, saying can you please tell us, Paul, more about the tools that Map My Plan 
made available to staff? Is there an app and website access? Uh, yeah, so Map My Plan is a completely web-based um, platform. It is a process of self-discovery where an individual comes onto a dashboard and they start to actually build out a plan. We ask a, a few questions. We start off with the most basic. Um, do you pay your credit card off each month? So it really is a holistic financial plan, right from those sort of questions. Because if an individual's got credit card debt, they need to stop and just focus on that and get that under control. We then take them through and say, well, let's make sure you can absorb a financial shock by making sure you've got some available cash, uh, but also protection goals. We don't use the word insurance. We try and stay away from industry lingo. Uh, but, you know, protect your assets and protect your bill of your own income. And then it takes people right through saving for a house, all different savings, their investments and everything. So it's, it's basically a tool that enables someone to build a plan for themselves by going through and asking certain questions. And based on the answers that they give, other questions are then asked. So to build a financial plan, it's a really big decision tree. Um, and we just make sure the individual only gets exposure to the part of the tree that's relevant for them at that point in time. So it's, it's not app-based, it's just web-based, but you can access it on any device. And when we work with employers, we set up an initial homepage. We also then embed other features and so forth and information that's relevant for those organisations as well. Um, so I'd encourage you to go on, have a play with it, and, and even just build a plan um, in the, the guise of, of an average employee. Um, and see what sort of journey, if it's relevant for, for your organisation. Wonderful. Thanks, Paul. And just a call out for any further questions. Bron, thank you from Bron. Fantastic. Thanks, Bron. Okay, so that looks like it might be the end of the questions for today. So I just wanted to uh, say heart thank you to Paul for certainly sharing some insights into the importance of supporting and addressing financial wellness in the workplace and I think as the likes of Ernst and Young have done it certainly has probably highlighted the importance of really taking the time to determine what the health and wellness needs are for the organisation and then being able to develop a targeted strategy off the back of that and certainly what we're finding more and more with our clients is that financial wellness is certainly rearing up as one of the, the key and important priorities for their, for their staff. Also, just one last thing as far as wrap up, just again, a reminder for those that may be interested as part of our broader Wellness Wise Academy, uh, as many of you would be aware, we run a nationally accredited Wellness Wise Practitioner Training Program, really equipping uh, people with the skills and knowledge on how to develop, implement and evaluate a best practice health and wellness strategy, certainly including financial wellness as a dimension. And we have our next round of courses coming up in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Hobart throughout October and November. So if that is something that is, is of interest, please stop by our website at www.wellnesswiseacademy.com.au. So with that, I'd just like to thank Paul very much for his time and we look forward to seeing you at the next Wellness Wise webinar. Thank you very much and have a great day.